Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the University of Notre Dame. Um, I'm going to be your MC for tonight. Uh, I'm the Archdiocesan Archivist, and I'm proud to say um, an alumnus from the University of Notre Dame as well. Um, I really enjoyed my time here. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners. Uh, so I begin by acknowledging the Noongar people, the traditional custodians of the land uh, on which we are gathered today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. Um, there's a few acknowledgements of guests. Uh, the Auxiliary Bishop, uh, Donald Sproxton, um, Bishop Jerry Houlihan, our Vicar General, Father Peter, um, the superiors of religious orders that have joined us this evening, uh, governors and trustees of the university, and benefactors, staff and students. The organising committee for tonight's event uh, is Dr Angela McCarthy, who's an adjunct lecturer in theology at the university and also a member of the plenary council. Uh, Monsignor Michael Keating, who's a former trustee of the university uh, and a governor of the university as well and a former Dean of St. Mary's Cathedral. Mr. Anthony Coit, who's the National Senior Executive Officer and Associate Director, Faith Formation at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, and last, Marco, uh, Dr. Marco Ceccarelli, who's the Director of the Centre for Faith Enrichment and also a Plenary Council member. Uh, we have a few apologies this evening. Uh, the Chancellor of the University, Mr. Chris Ellison, um, Archbishop Costello, unfortunately, was unable to make it, um, and Archbishop Kay Goldsworthy. I'm going to hand over to Monsignor Keating to read the Plenary Council Prayer. Can we take this moment while Monsignor is coming up to the lectern just to switch our phones to silent, please? Thank you. Thanks, Oren. He didn't tell you his name as Oren, the archivist, and a very good person, too. I, um, good evening, everyone. <laughs> and um, as you, you'd all know, most of you would know, from the 3rd to the 10th of October, the first session of the uh, Plenary Council will take place for the whole of Australia. And I'd like to welcome, in a particular way, several of the delegates who are here. We welcome them very uh, much so, and I'd like you to join in the prayer. You've got the card, it might be up on the screen too, is it, the prayer? Everyone's got a card. So could you join in the plenary council prayer with me, please? This is principally, as I read it, for the many delegates who are here and the other delegates who couldn't be here. Right, together then. Come, Holy Spirit of Pentecost, Come, Holy Spirit of the great South land. May God bless and unite all your people of Australia and guide us on the pilgrim way of the plenary council. Give us the grace to see your face in one another and to recognize Jesus, our land of God. Give us the courage to tell our stories and to speak boldly of your truth. Give us ears to listen to each other and a discerning heart to hear what you are saying. Lead your church into a hope-filled future that we may live the joy of the gospel through Jesus Christ, our Lord, bread of the journey from age to age. Amen. Our Lady Help of Christians, pray for us, and St. Mary MacKillop, pray for us. So please keep the prayers and say them over the next few weeks. Thank you, Monsignor, and <clears throat> okay. I just thought I'd start off before we go into the um, presentations this evening, uh, in just talking a little bit about the purpose of the event um, and how it's all come about. Um, so the purpose of the event is to promote the discourse uh, into the history of the Catholic Church and its place in contemporary society. Uh, and we thought collectively what better way to talk, uh, to encourage that discourse in the lead up to the plenary council 
um, than to feature local leaders telling their personal histories. So the theme of tonight is personal histories. There's been a long history within the Archdiocese of lay initiatives promoting engagement with the church. The Children of Mary Solidarity and the Catholic Young Men's Society started this work as far back as the 1860s. The Catholic Young Men's Society hosted similar events and undertook charitable works that were linked to the rule of St Vincent de Paul. The Children of Mary were focused um, on women uh, and undertook charitable works, charitable and other works. The word uh, solidity, uh, sodality, sorry, <laughs> excuse me, sodality um, is not one that we hear a great deal anymore and is an expression of the church uh, through a specialised or task orientated form. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating recently said it's a word that's missing from our contemporary language. Uh, this evening we've asked, we've set the task of our three local leaders um, who are members of our church to respond to two very personal questions about their experience of the church. The two questions are, what has been your experience of faith and church? And by this we mean, how has the church shaped who you have become? What is your hope for the future of the church? By this we mean, what is the hope for the church within your life? I'll now, now hand over to Angela to introduce the first speaker. Thank you, Oren, and good evening and welcome. So we have three speakers tonight, and the first is the Honourable Chief Justice Peter Quinlan. Peter was appointed to the Supreme Court of Western Australia on the 13th of August 2018. He was appointed as a judge of the court, a judge of the Court of Appeal, and as Chief Justice of Western Australia. Chief Justice Quinlan's legal career commenced in 1993 as the professional assistant to K.H. Parker, AOQC, Solicitor General for Western Australia, who also served at the Supreme Court of Western Australia. From 1996 to 2001, the Chief Justice was a legal officer and ultimately Assistant Crown Counsel at the WA Crown Solicitor's Office before joining the Independent Bar in 2001. He was appointed Senior Counsel in 2010. The Chief Justice was appointed Solicitor General for Western Australia on the 1st of July 2016 and served in this role until his appointment to the bench. He served as president of the WA Bar Association from 2012 to 2015 and the Board of Governors at the University of Notre Dame from 2008. The Chief Justice is also the Lieutenant Governor of Western Australia. Chief Justice Quinlan is married to the set and they have five children. He's oblate of the Holy Trinity Abbey, New Norcia. The presentation tonight will not be in the legal vein, but will be a very personal one. So please welcome the Honourable Chief Justice, Peter Quinlan. Thank you, Angela. This year marks 100, the 175th anniversary of the arrival of Dom Rosendo Salvado OSB to Western Australia. Salvado arrived in 1846, destined to establish a monastery and mission at New Norcia among the UED people of the Noongar nation to our north. That year, Salvado and his companions made their first journey up the Durbel Yerrigan, what we also know as the Swan River the river that reaches the ocean here in Fremantle, where we gather tonight. They travelled up the river, as Salvado later put it, interspersing the voyage with litanies and hymns. In describing what he saw on the journey, Salvado said this, quote, majestic eucalypts, thick-leaved smaller trees, bush with trunks burnt halfway up, shores covered with green plants, some native and some planted by human hand. All this offered such a brilliant variety that every part of the winding course gave us something fresh to see 
and some fresh occasion to praise the Creator. In that spirit, can I acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, who have cared for it and its spirit since time immemorial. I pay my respects to their elders past and present for their continuing stewardship of this land that has also become our home. Bishop Sproxton, Bishop Holohan, Vicar General, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for the invitation to speak tonight at this inaugural event reflecting on the history of the church in Australia and its place in contemporary society. Eva, Francis and I have been asked to speak to our experience in the church and to say something about how it has brought us to the present day and then to say something for our hope for the future of the church in Australia. Now you've probably seen already that Eva's got a show bag with things to display. So hers will be a more visual presentation. Uh, and in the spirit of tonight being about the history of the church, I thought the best way to place my experience is actually to describe my own family history or a slice of it to show how histories such as ours are inextricably linked with the history of the church in Western Australia. In my family's case, I hope it will become clear that in the most literal sense, without the church in Western Australia, there would be no Quinlan family. Now, the voyage that took Dom Salvado to the Swan River in 1846 coincided with the arrival of the first Bishop of Perth, John Brady, Brady had been appointed and consecrated as bishop in Rome a year earlier on the 5th, 25th of May, 1845. Also on the vessel that brought them to Perth was Mother Ursula Frayne, RSM, and a small band of Sisters of Mercy. The Sisters of Mercy, of course, went on to make an enormous contribution to the life of the church and to Western Australia that continues to this day. So 1846 was a significant year in the history of the church in Western Australia. 1853, it must be said, was not quite so well remembered. Nevertheless, on the 31st of August that year, a convict ship, the Phoebe Dunbar, arrived at Fremantle from Kingston Island. One of the convicts, Daniel Connor, was my great-great-grandfather. Connor, a native of County Kerry, had been sentenced to seven years imprisonment and transportation. Connor was given his ticket of leave less than, two, less than a year later and settled in the Guildford region and later in 2J, or Newcastle as it was then known. Being granted a ticket of leave and later a conditional pardon did not make Connor any more respectable. Starting out as a hawker and later a publican and mill owner, Connor was known as a ruthless businessman. In 1861, the resident magistrate at 2J described him as, quote, capable of uttering the most gross falsehoods which are near akin to dishonesty. <laughs> Fortunately for the people of 2J, Connor married a kind English, uh, Irish, oh, I almost said English then, <laughs> Irish servant woman, Catherine Conway, who worked at the Catholic Church in Guildford. Catherine Connor tempered her husband's harshness. She was known to intervene to stop Connor from exploiting farmers who were in his debt, but who nevertheless had to grist their wheat at his mill. Once, when a farmer, down to his last bag of wheat, wanted it milled so as to be able to feed his young family, Mrs. Connor warned him to go elsewhere to prevent her husband from seizing the flower. After Daniel Connor died, and as Catherine Conway Connor became more and more frail, she was taken in and cared for her in her final years by the Sisters of Mercy, who by this time uh, had extended to education, health and welfare for all throughout Western Australia. The first Quinlan to arrive in Western Australia was one of my other great-great-grandfathers, Michael Quinlan, 
a native of County Tipperary who arrived in 1863 with his wife and young son, Timothy Francis Quinlan, my great-grandfather. Michael Quinlan was a blacksmith, once described in colonial correspondence as, quote, a civil, lazy fellow. He also settled in 2J. But two years later, in 1865, he joined a new settlement at Camden Harbour in the Kimberley, leaving his pregnant wife Maria, Timothy, and their other daughter Mary behind. The attempted settlement at Camden Harbour was a kind of violence that so ravaged the Aboriginal peoples of this land for so much of the colonisation of Australia. And in September 1865, Michael Quinlan died of drowning at Camden Harbour. He was 25 years old. Among his personal effects was what was described as, quote, a Roman Catholic prayer book. The book was a copy of Bishop Richard Challoner's Manual of Spiritual Exercises, The Garden of the Soul. Quinlan's death alone was, of course, tragedy enough for his young family. As news of his death travelled south, however, the tragedy was made worse by news travelling north. Because back in June of that year, although he didn't know it, Quinlan's wife Maria had died shortly after giving birth to twins. On the very day that Quinlan drowned, the resident magistrate in 2J was drawing up a statement of expenditure for Quinlan's children, Timothy, Mary and one of the twins. The other twin had died almost immediately after Maria. We don't know what became of the surviving twin, but Timothy and Mary, the Quinlan orphans as they became known in the colony, were billeted to different families over the succeeding months and the property that was left behind their par- by their parents was used for maintenance. Among their property were three cows. The three cows were entrusted to none other than Daniel Connor. Ever the one to profit from the misfortune of others, Connor sold the cows, claiming that he needed to defray the expenses that he'd incurred in feeding them. By the end of 1866, all of the property left by Michael and Maria Quinlan was gone. It was proposed by the colonial authorities that the Quinlan orphans would be placed in the poorhouse in Perth. Their future looked bleak. At this point, a young priest in the colony, Father Matthew Gibney, made his move. He suggested that Joseph Riley, a young but up-and-coming layman in Perth, accompany him on a trip to 2J. Riley was a newspaperman who, with Gibney, founded The Record, the Catholic newspaper still published in magazine form to this day. On the way back from 2J, Father Gibney brought the two Quinlan orphans, telling Riley that they had to be handed over to the poorhouse in Perth. No doubt, as intended by Father Gibney, their plight touched Riley because by the time they reached Perth, he'd decided to raise the children as members of his own family. Timothy and Mary, however, were never formally adopted. They were to remain Quinlans. Father Gibney, as some of you may know, was the priest who gave Ned Kelly his last rites at Glen Rowan in 1880. He went on to become the third Bishop of Perth from 1886 to 1910. Bishop Gibney and Timothy Quinlan were to have much to do with one another in the years that followed as Timothy rose in prominence and influence in Western Australia. Sadly, the Diocese of Perth under Bishop Gibney became engulfed in financial scandal and Gibney was forced to resign. In 1909, when a deputation of leading Catholic laity travelled to Adelaide to report on the dire situation in Perth to Archbishop O'Reilly, the metropolitan for the province that included Western Australia, it was Timothy Quinlan who led the expedition. It must have been heartbreaking for him to take the stand that he did, given the life-saving kindness shown to him by the young father, Gibney, 43 years earlier on that trip from 2J to Perth. 
In addition to become a, becoming a successful business leader, T.F. Quinlan entered politics, rising to the position of Speaker of the Legislative Assembly. And fittingly, for most of his time in Parliament, including when he was Speaker, Quinlan was the member for 2J. According to an article in the Northern Advertiser at the time, when he was first elected to the seat in 1897, Quinlan was carried through 2J on the shoulders of his supporters. But he had a more significant and enduring connection to 2J. In 1883, he married Theresa Connor, the daughter of none other than Daniel Connor, the shrewd businessman who'd sold his three cows almost 20 years earlier. Timothy and Theresa had eight children, including my grandfather, Daniel. Timothy remained a benefactor of the church to whom he owed so much throughout his whole life and sponsored the arrival of many religious institutes and orders in coming to Western Australia. One connection that I hold particularly dear was Timothy's lifelong friendship with the Benedictine community at New Norcia, a friendship that I was able to rekindle 100 years later. When Dom Salvado, by now Bishop Salvado, died in Rome in 1900 and was ultimately returned to his beloved New Norcia, T.F. Quinlan was one of the pallbearers at the Requiem Mass at St Mary's Cathedral. My grandfather Daniel, an obstetrician and gynaecologist, and his wife, Mary Angela Tynan, Molly, in turn had four children, the youngest son being my father Michael, and the middle son being my uncle, Tony Quinlan, who is here this evening. Again, however, tragedy struck the young family when Molly died at a young age, leaving behind her young family. My father was around the same age that his own grandfather, Timothy, was when he had lost his own mother, Maria, in 1865. And once again, it was the church that stepped in together with the Tynan family, to help pick up the broken pieces of the young family. The boys entered the care of the Jesuit fathers and brothers at St Louis Boarding School, and as Daniel continued his medical practice at St John of God Hospital in Subiaco, the family also became very close to the sisters of St John of God. The influence of the Jesuit fathers was no, most pronounced on my uncle, Father Tim Quinlan, SJ, who entered the Jesuit novitiate in 1954 and remained a loyal son of St Ignatius until his death in 2001. With postgraduate qualifications in psychology and spirituality, Uncle Tim, as he was known to us, was a much loved and sought after spiritual director. In my father's case, it was the Sisters of St John of God with whom he formed a lifelong bond and commitment. His connection to the Sisters and to the St John of God healthcare was beautifully memorialised at his funeral last year when the staff of St John of God Subiaco, doctors, nurses, administrators, cleaners, lined Salvado Road in a guard of honour as his funeral cortege left St Joseph's Church. I hope you see then that not for the first time in our family's history, the church through its laity, its clergy and its religious orders was there to bind the wounds of the family and restore it to health. The motto of the Sisters of St John of God, Caritas Christi Urge et Nos, the love of Christ urges us, was not an abstract principle. It was a tangible reality in their lives that was brought to life by the people of the church and demanded a response in return. In my father's case, I have no doubt that his own lifelong commitment to the healing mission of Christ in all its manifestations was a response to the love of Christ that he'd received from the hands of others. It was a response of faith, no doubt, but also one born of deep human gratitude. At the same time, another theme that ran through my family history and which I certainly learned from my father in his own gentle way was that notwithstanding the remarkable rise to prominence of forebears such as Timothy Francis Quinlan, there was always a sense in which we remained as Catholics and as Quinlans 
not quite respectable. Growing up, I can remember of a, a number of occasions in my father's professional life when responding to the call of Christ required him to stand out, to stand apart, and to see and do things differently to those around him. The very existence of this university is an illustration of that sense. The founding fathers and mothers of this university, of which he was one, sensed rightly that as much as the sons and daughters of the church had become part of the institutions of the state, there remained a need for spaces where a distinctive Catholic engagement with contemporary Australian society could find expression. And so I turn from this little potted history of the church in my family to the future, my hopes for the church in Australia. In doing so, I will not offer any views or suggestions for institutional reforms, leadership structures or decision-making in the church. I will leave that to others more learned in those matters than I. My hope for the future of the church, my hope for the church as it continues to shape my life is as a matter of vision. A hope for an ever more clear vision. I will refer to this vision as a Eucharistic vision, as it is a vision that must unite the presence of Christ in our liturgy with the presence of Christ in our world. I referred earlier to the fact that to be a part of the church is not quite and must never be quite respectable. One of the ways in which the church has remained countercultural has been in its dogged and scandalous insistence on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. It has been scandalous, of course, from the very beginning. It was, after all, the bread of life discourse preached by Christ at Capernaum that led many of the disciples to grumble, this is a hard teaching, who can accept it? And so over the past two millennia, there have been countless efforts to domesticate the Eucharist, to rationalise it and to explain it away, all to no avail. I'm sure many of you will know the wonderful story of Flannery O'Connor, the American Southern Gothic writer, when she attended a dinner with a group of New York intellectuals and writers when she was in her early 20s. Towards the end of a long night, conversation turned towards the Eucharist. I'll let O'Connor pick up the story in her own words, but I cannot do the deep Southern accent. <laughs> Mrs Broadwater, the host, said that when she was a child and received the host, she thought of it as the Holy Ghost, he being the most portable person of the Trinity. Now she thought of it as a symbol and implied it was a pretty good one. I then said, in a very shaky voice, well, if it's a symbol, to hell with it. That was all the defence I was capable of, but I realise now that this is all I will ever be able to say about it outside of a story, except that it is the centre of existence for me. All the rest of life is expendable. One of the great gifts of the, church the church's insistence on the presence of Christ in the Eucharist is that it trains us to have what I've called a Eucharistic vision. It trains us to see through the surface of things and past the ordinariness of things. It trains us to understand that things are not always as they appear and that the presence of Christ often lies hidden in plain sight and in places where we cannot or do not want to see it. It is this vision, I want to suggest, that is so important for us as the church in the future as we move out from our liturgy and our worship and turn towards the world. How important it is that we bring a Eucharistic vision to the world so as to be able to see the presence of Christ in all of the brokenness and contradictions in our world, to see that Christ plays in all of it. Yes. Yes. 
to slightly adapt the words of Gerard Manley Hopkins, SJ, act in God's eye what in God's eye you are, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of our faces. In God's eye, Christ plays in 10,000 places, 10 billion faces everywhere. And it is only to the extent that we see Christ in all of those around us, and perhaps most especially when we see him in the faces of the most marginalised, the most despised in our community, that our vision becomes clear. That we see Christ in the face of four-year-old and two-year-old orphans, as Joseph Riley did, that we see Christ in the face of the farmer down to his last bag of wheat, as Catherine Connor Conway did, that we see Christ in the faces of hospital workers forming a guard of honour at a funeral for a man they have never met, that we see Christ in the face of the Aboriginal owners of Camden Harbour murdered in defence of their traditional lands, that we see Christ in the face of the criminal sentence to seven years imprisonment and in the ruthless businessman, even when the criminal and the businessman like Daniel Connor are one and the same person. That we see Christ in the face of all those who are broken and wounded, including those who are now alienated from or even hate the church, often because of the suffering and harm that the church's own members have caused them through malice, negligence or ignorance. And then with that Eucharistic vision of those around us that we respond to the Christ in them by the Christ in us and in the whole church, that we act in God's eye what in God's eye we are and that our going out to meet them to bind up their wounds is so thoroughly extravagant that there is something not quite respectable about it. Can I end with my favourite, or one of my favourite images of the church? It's again from Flannery O'Connor, who's having something of a renaissance now, and comes at the end of her short story, Revelation. Revelation follows a day in the life of Mrs Turpin, a self-important, respectable farmer's wife who thanks Jesus she and her husband Claude are not like the other trash around them. Mrs Turpin's worldview is shattered by a moment of grace which in typical Flannery O'Connor style comes when a young college student, appropriately named Mary Grace, throws a textbook at her and calls her an old warthog from hell. The story concludes with Mrs Turpin seeing a vision as she looks up from the pig pen on her and Claude's farm to see a light in the sky. Quote, a visionary light settled in her eyes. She saw the streak in the sky as a vast swinging bridge extending upward from the earth through a field of living fire. Upon it, a vast horde of souls were rumbling toward heaven. There were whole companies of white trash cleaned for the first time in their lives and bands of black slaves in white robes, and battalions of freaks and lunatics shouting and clapping and leaping like frogs. And bringing up the end of the procession was a tribe of people who she recognised at once as those who, like herself and Claude, had always a little of everything and the God-given wit to use it right. O'Connor's, of course, talking about us all of us in this room, the respectable professional Christians. The story continues. Mrs Turpin leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind the others with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behaviour. They alone were on key. Yet she could see by their altered and shocked faces that even their virtues were being burned away. What an exquisite image of purgatory and ultimately of the church. 
even their virtues were being burned away. In the woods around her, the invisible cricket choruses had struck up, but what she heard were the voices of the souls climbing upward into the starry field and shouting, Alleluia. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. What an amazing story. How West Australian, how delightful. I would just remind you that any questions or comments, there'll be time for that after we've heard um, our three speakers. Our second speaker is Eva Skira. Eva Skira is a non-executive director based in Perth, and Eva is chair of the Association of Ministerial Public Juridical Persons. I had to practice that the peak body of 11 Catholic canonical entities and ministries, including schools, hospitals and aged care facilities. Because of this canonical role, she's a member of the Plenary Council of Australia. Eva is chair of the trustees of St John of God Healthcare, which has a ministry that includes 16 public and private hospitals and disability, mental health and homelessness services. Eva is currently chair of the ASX-listed McMahon Limited, a mining services contractor, and a director of Western Power, the WA Cricket Association, and the WA Parks Foundation. In the past, Eva's directorships included chair of the Water Corporation of Western Australia, WA Forest Products Commission, and West Scheme Superannuation Fund, she was Deputy Chancellor of Murdoch University and a Director of MDA National Insurance, Doric Constructions and ASX listed AOS Limited. Eva has also been a Director of a number of not-for-profit entities. Eva's background is in banking and stockbroking. She has an MBA from IMD in Switzerland and an Honours degree from the University of New South Wales. She's a fellow of several professional bodies, including the Australian Institute of Company Directors and of the Governance Institute of Australia. Eva was awarded the Order of Australia in the 2019 Australia Day Honours and is the 2017 Gold Medal Award winner for the Australian Institute of Company Directors. Please welcome Eva Skira. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a privilege to be here tonight at this Church History Symposium and I must admit I did have a chuckle or a smile when I was asked to be doing personal reflections at a Church History Symposium and I thought, have I become that old that I'm now history? <laughs> but nevertheless... When I reflect on tonight's question, what has been my experience of faith and church, my answer is threefold. As represented in the school student, the board member, and the canonical steward. In other words, a Catholic triangulation of formation, stewardship, and vocation. I've broken this down into three phases. The first phase, I was born into a Ukrainian Catholic family in Tasmania. My parents were refugees coming out from Europe after World War II. They settled in Tasmania to get as far away from communist Russia as they could. They brought very little with them their qualifications were not recognised in Australia and they did manual labour. Mine is a very typical refugee family story. No assets. My parents worked hard, long hours. They scrimped and saved and invested their dreams and hopes into their three children. Mum and Dad, Irina and Joseph, were very strong Ukrainian Catholics 
a Greek Eastern Rite Catholic Church in full communion with the Roman Catholic Church. The Ukrainian Catholic Church in Australia, in, the, in Launceston in the 60s, was a very small community. The priest would come and visit four times a year from Melbourne. But with my parents' commitment in that community, it was strong enough that it gave a strong faith and, and, and understanding to the children that they were Ukrainian Catholics. To understand that Catholicism, it helps to understand the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Under the Russian Soviet regime, it was the largest underground church in the world. It was a persecuted religion. So I have a very strong sense of a persecuted religion. I have a very strong sense of priests and monks and the religious being incarcerated and being put to death. And that is very recent in the 20th century. And that's my parents' religion. That's the Ukrainian Catholic Church. And I lost one of my uncles who was a, U a Ukrainian Catholic patriot and who got shot. But the commitment of those people was very strong. And they, when they came here, they brought, they brought that history. But with my parents devout in their faith, and they respected and had great admiration for the priests and bishop in Melbourne, then that is the respect and faith that the child develops. Then I was sent to Roman Catholic schools in Launceston. My first school was La Menia School, which was um, established by the Sisters of Nazareth as part of their aged care facility. And then my secondary school was Sacred Heart College, run by the Presentation Sisters. Now, I love school, and again, it's a typical refugee story of, of uh, loving, loving education and really shining at it. I loved it all. I loved the, I loved the religious education lessons. I loved the sisters. And it's a, it's a story where the route to education, the path of education is a route out of refuge, refugee poverty. So the Catholic formation at school, for me, was superb. So I'm a product of both Ukrainian Catholicism and I had Irish teachers and Irish Catholicism. So I straddle the worlds of Ukrainian Catholic and Roman Catholic and I seamlessly, to some extent, go across, the, go across both. I call myself by ritual. Now, that's a, a loose in the canonical sense. It's not, it's not exactly correct in the canonical sense. But it does work for me that I am comfortable in the Catholic, Roman Catholic Church. I'm comfortable in the Ukrainian Catholic Church. And so what I have a sense, I have a sense of a global church with different gifts being brought, diversity to being brought to a global church. Now, phase two of my faith journey... And that's been via appointments to boards of Catholic ministries. In 1993, I was invited onto the board of a Daughters of Charity, Charity Ministries in Perth, the precursor to what was later renamed Rua. There I discovered the wonderful community works of that congregation, reaching out to those vulnerable, whether it was mental health, homelessness, loneliness, drug use, alcohol addiction, prisoners or former prisoners. When I joined, there were daughters on the board plus the wonderful lay managers. Witnessing the commitment of all staff in that organisation to reaching out to those who need help was inspiring. We on the board prayed together, reflected together, made decisions together and supported management. It was a group and it is an organisation that every day animates Catholic social teaching the inherent dignity of the individual at its core. A few years later, I was invited onto the board of St John of God Healthcare, where I remained for 13 years. The formation and growth in my faith during that time is one of the more profound chapters of my faith journey. And I call this phase of my Catholic faith as growing into an understanding of theology of care. 
It is sometimes said that the Catholic Church is the largest healthcare provider in the world. Jesus' story of the Good Samaritan, told in Luke's simple words, has provided inspiration to countless millions, including St John of God in Granada among them, to go and do likewise. The compassion the Samaritan felt for the beaten traveller is the compassion that as Catholics we are called to bring to the ministry, to the sick, the vulnerable, the disadvantaged. Our neighbour, as Jesus reminds us, is everyone. And so this is a relentless 24-7 calling for all of those involved in the ministry and leadership of healthcare. Alongside the exhortation to go and do likewise sits the Catholic notion of encounter. And it's this notion of encounter that I have felt very much while I was a board member at St John and God Healthcare. And this notion of encounter has a deep spiritual significance in our Catholic tradition. It implies reciprocity, connection and intention. And it is something that Pope Francis has spoken out about and strongly encourages. He has used the term frequently to communicate the idea of reaching out, of going past ourselves and of being there for others, particularly the sick, the vulnerable and all neglected. It involves deep, active engagement, as Pope Francis said, not just seeing, but looking, not just hearing, but listening. Allowing yourself to be moved with compassion. It recognises the value of the small gesture, the everyday moment, and the importance of consistency. And that is the health care that we try to provide at St John of God, and that's the health care that Catholic Health in Australia tries to provide. The sisters of St John of God are some of the most inspirational women that I have encountered. Their history, their challenges, the early deaths on the goldfields, their commitment to nursing the sick, struggling to find the money to run their hospitals, their social entrepreneurship in new, opening new hospitals, such as going across to Ballarat on the invitation of the bishop and opening a hospital in 1915 into Geraldton in 1930s and Bunbury in the 1920s and so on. But they are understated, unassuming, holy women. They go under the radar. I've gotten to know some of them and they have formed and influenced me by their soft encouragement and strong trust. The Sisters of St John of God have hospitality and the healthcare system has hospitality as one of its values. In one of his addresses in 2018, Pope Francis reflected on the importance of true hospitality. He spoke of it as one of the works of mercy, revealed as a truly human and Christian virtue, a virtue which in today's world is at risk of being overlooked. I've been very fortunate that the formation admission programs at St John of God Healthcare are first class and that as a board member, we received much formation over the period. It's, it's, my, it's helped me to my witness, my understanding, my knowledge of Catholic social teaching, the Catholic Code of Ethical Standards, and it's come to represent one of the pillars of my faith. The third phase of my faith journey has been during the past decade when I left the board and I was invited to become a trustee of St John of God Healthcare, where I'm now a canonical steward with eight others, which means leading one of those public juridic persons entity that Angela mentioned. So this PJP is called St John of God Australia Limited. It was set up 17 years ago by the sisters of St John of God, and it was to allow a, a transfer of the sponsorship of the healthcare ministries from the sisters to an organisation led by lay people. And this is where, as a leader of the PJP, I feel my particular vocation has emerged. While my primary vocation within the church is as a married person, being a canonical steward has meant another vocation, a particular or secondary vocation. The word vocation comes from a Latin word which means to be called. All of us are called by God to live a life of love and service. But a particular vocation is a call from God. And on reflection, I think that process is anything but simple. While many people may think of a vocation as what they are called to do in life, 
God's calling means it is grounded in faith. Our true vocation does not come from the world, but rather is an indirect in, an invitation directly from God to follow him. The call for lay leaders to become, to become leaders in the church reflects the gospel calling. In a message released in May for World Mission Sunday, Pope Francis talked about COVID-19 as an opportunity for mission and service to others, to step out of ourselves and respond to our neighbours and refer to the book of Isaiah. In all of this, God's question, whom shall I send, is addressed once more to us and awaits a generous and convincing response, here am I, send me. Together, our group of trustees is a response to the question. We are a mini faith community. We pray together, we do formation together, we discern and make decisions together. Leading a Catholic organisation where we have obligations and duties to our Catholic members has been a wonderful journey. It calls for thinking longer term, and so we often refer to prophetic leadership. And I think it is prophetic leadership that we are called to do at this moment, indeed any moment. And a prophetic means that we have to paint, paint a picture of an alternative reality. It means that we need to play a part in God's mission to the world. And a prophetic leadership is a combination of prophet and leadership. So it's not identical, neither of those are identical. I've talked about the three phases. I now want to talk to the second question that we will pose, which is, what is your hope for the future of the church? So what do I want to see? When I look at my life and its influences, they paint the picture. And so at a very practical level, it's about four things. Firstly, given the influence of my early education and family, I think Catholic education for our children, primary and secondary, is paramount if we want strong, committed people of faith. Committed teachers, engendering it, love of the church, knowledge of the scriptures, its theology, the sacraments, the Eucharist. I think we are blessed to have a strong Catholic education sector in Australia. It is the greatest gift we can give to future young generations. We need to keep it and grow it. Secondly, strong and accessible adult formation programs I think are important. They've greatly helped me. They can occur particularly in our Catholic ministries in healthcare, education, community services, aged care. There is a large natural demographic in our ministries and a natural symbiosis of our mission, our not-for-profit status and our workforce and volunteers. And thirdly to me, the future of the church will be about service and excellence it's not Catholic to run second-rate works or just average schools or ordinary health services. We need to run excellent ministries. We need to have outstanding and wonderfully talented people. And fourthly, my future is inviting lay leaders to be leaders in the church, whether at a higher governance level or at a ministry level. I found young people in a church are hungry for further meaningful involvement and want to contribute. Many people can be trusted to lead in the church as witnessed by wonderful board members, senior executives, professional managers and supervisors. And related to this is widening our definition, our imagination of what a good Catholic leader looks like. It is trusting those around us. It is trusting lay leaders. The sisters many years ago put their faith and confidence in lay leaders and have worked, walked the pilgrim journey together, enabling participation, empowerment and intrinsic growth. The opportunity given to me and others in the public juridic persons, entities as lay leaders is truly life-changing and a wonderful way to grow and improve the leadership of our apostolic works for contemporary times. I think we all need to step up at these times and foster a Catholic church that gathers all to its life and works. So the contemporary church themes of co-responsibility and synodality are the paths we need to undertake. 
In conclusion, I'm very, hope I'm very hopeful for the church in this plenary council process. As we contemplate the future, we will, I think we'll see it providing a light and pathway for our church in Australia. As Pope Francis said while speaking in 2017 to his young audience in Vancouver, the future does have a name and its name is hope. Now, what I'd like to do is mention on personal note. And my first personal note is that I have a basket of artefacts, which to me are holy and sacred. And so when you declutter, when you move from one house to another, a large house to a small apartment, it's a great way to discover all those things you had and put them all together in one place. So I thought as a testimony to the way the church has shaped me, but I would bring some of the artefacts, they are holy, that have shaped me. My mother's 1960 missile is in that basket. My two brothers who have passed away some years ago, one of them, their scapula, is in that basket. It is holy. And perhaps finally, on a very personal note, at 3 a.m. this morning, my mother passed away. So in my mind, this holy basket. So I've called this in my mind the Irina Skira, dedication and graduate a gratitude address. She is now in God's arms, or as we would say in the Ukrainian Catholic Church, Vichnaya. Pamyat. Thank you. Thank you, Eva, for that extraordinary address. And we all know that Eva's mother is in God's hands. Our third presenter this evening is Professor Francis Campbell. He's not Australian. Is that OK? <laughs> Professor Campbell joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office as a member of His Majesty's, Her Majesty's, diplomatic service in 1997. He's also worked at the United Nations Security Council in New York and the European Union. From 1999 to 2003, he served on the staff of the then Prime Minister, Tony Blair, as policy advisor and then private secretary. He also served on secondment with Amnesty International as the senior director of policy. From 2005 to 2011, he served as Her Majesty's ambassador to the Holy See. From 2011 to 2013, he served as deputy high commissioner in Pakistan. From 2013 to 2014, he was head of the policy unit in the FCO and director of innovation at UK Trade and Investment. From 2014 to 2020, Professor Campbell served as Vice-Chancellor of St Mary's University in London and Professor of International Relations. In February 2020, Professor Campbell became the fourth Vice-Chancellor of the University of Notre Dame, Australia. He's been a member of the advisory panel of the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner, London, and several governing bodies for tertiary education and healthcare organisations internationally. More recently, Professor Campbell was appointed a governor of the Forest Research Foundation, a member of the Divine Word University Council for Papua New Guinea, member of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities Board of Directors, a founding member of the International Council on Human Trafficking at St Thomas University, Miami, School of Law and Commissioner of the National Catholic Education Commission. Professor Campbell was educated at Queen's University Belfast and Trinity College Dublin and also holds degrees from universities in Leuven, Krakow, Pennsylvania as well. Professor Campbell has been recognised with a number of honorary doctorates, degree, doctorate degrees from universities across the globe. So we welcome Professor Campbell.
Thank you, Angela. Um, if my mother were here, she'd be very proud. If my father was here, he'd say, I wouldn't believe a word of it. So, <laughs> distinguished ladies and gentlemen, bishops, monsignors, members of the clergy, uh, to my two fellow speakers, uh, to Peter and to Eva. If I just start, Peter, with just a, a few words to you about your father, who you spoke about so eloquently. And along with um, Peter Tannock, I met your father on the 5th of July uh, last year, 2020. And I was told, um, I, you're going over to Sydney, the border will reopen at the end of July, so go on the 5th of July. And I met Peter and Michael in Bread and Common, and the flight was leaving, and your father was rushing out uh, as I was getting in the taxi, and he said, I haven't spoken to you yet about New Norcia. You have to go to New Norcia. And it's on the shoulders um, of, of giants that we stand, and your father is uh, one of the giants of this university that forever uh, lives on here in terms of lay apostolate, and we're very grateful for his legacy. Eva, our hearts go out to you um, this evening, and again, uh, what better way to honor your mother than to talk about the gift of faith in the way that you have done so beautifully. Uh, Aaron and Angela, thank you very much uh, for this evening. In particular, Monsignor Michael, uh, for putting all this together, ably helped by Anthony, wherever Anthony is sitting. He's over here on the right. I was told today, Monsignor Michael, he was very nervous all day to make sure everything was right for you this evening. And it really is a delight to be with you. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've posed a very difficult question this evening, and there's a lot of distinguished people governors, trustees, and other founder of the university sitting here in front of me, uh, Peter. So it's very difficult to speak. But I would like to single out one group of distinguished uh, people that are here this evening. I know there are two of them, at least, but I know there are many more. And you will see probably why I want to single them out. Um, I've met one sister from St. John of God. She's from Mayo. I've met another sister, a presentation sister. And I know the presentation sisters are here, and I know the sisters of St. John of God are here. If there are Mercy sisters here or any other congregation, can I just ask you to stand up for a moment, please? Please stand up. Okay. Um, you, you deserve to be standing out down here giving a talk because of the gift of faith and because of the witness and because of the fact that you've left your own country. And as Peter talked about the monks who came from Spain, from Catalonia, and opened New Norcia, and whose graves are out at New Norcia, and when you go through them, you can see the gift of faith that missionaries like you have brought to this country. So it's an honor and a privilege to have you here this evening and to speak in front of you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm just going to give a quick look up to the clock because you've given a very dangerous thing to give an Irishman a mic. <laughs> um, now, ladies and gentlemen, you've asked the question, what has been your experience of faith and church? And then you've qualified it in brackets. And you've asked, how has the church shaped who you have become? That's the tougher question. And it's a very difficult question in some respects. Uh, perhaps the Irish-born of you in the room, and if there's any Northerners in the room, you will know that this is a topic we never talk about. Um, I've talked about it once before. The second question is, what is your hope for the future of the church? That's much easier. What is your hope for the church in your life? But the two questions are connected. Ladies and gentlemen, when you, when you stand and reflect um, on that question, how has the church shaped who you have become? I think like others who've stood here, like Peter and like Eva, but in a different context, it shapes uh, the very foundation of who you are. So at a certain stage, I suppose, in my life, I didn't know whether I was attracted to politics or to faith in one sense. And maybe in some cultures, those two things are not mutually exclusive. 
but at the time when I was born, I was born in 1970, those two things had different calls on you, but in a context of a conflated identity. What I struggled with as a teenager, as a young person, was every time that I would hear uh, something come on the news, you, you would always uh, a pattern to activity that it would come as a news flash, something had happened, uh, there would either be a bomb or somebody would be shot. And the very first thing you were doing you was you were listening to hear where it was, who it was, and was there something that would define that person, that would define them as one of them or one of us? Now, that question, even if it's there for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, even if the civilizing human element of you, after a minute, has sorrow for whatever victim is there, but if you're a young teenager, and you're listening and you're living in a society that, that has become very divided and very tribal, that is a frightening question if you profess the Christian faith. So that struggle, um, which I think wasn't confined uh, to me, I think it was a struggle in relation to society at that time. Where did it get an outlet? There were two parts of the society where you didn't feel second class. The church and the school. And the schools were church schools. Today, sometimes people try to revisit and address the issue of Catholic education and to try to say that somehow the schools uh, caused the conflict or the Catholic schools caused the conflict. If you were from a background like mine, then the school was the only way out. And in fact, the school was not what caused the conflict, nor was it the churches that caused the conflict. In fact, it was faith that acted as a restraint. Faith liberated you from societal divisions, and it got right into the heart of who you were and what you believed. And all too often, we're told in the contemporary period about religion fueling violence. In my experience, religion restrained the violence. And I know Deborah sitting here is the executive director of Catholic education in Western Australia. And my memory of schools, of Catholic schools in the state sector, priests, nuns, lay teachers, Day in, day out, de-radicalizing, challenging, whether it was history, whether it was religion class. If you took one position, which happened to be an Irish nationalist position or a Catholic position, my teacher of religion, who was a priest, would respond with the Anglican position, the Zwinglian position, the Calvinist position, or the Lutheran position. They were opening minds, prizing open minds in a context where it would have been very easy to have played to the gallery and to have fueled the closure of minds. So you ask me the question, how has the church shaped who you have become? Well, in those parishes, in those schools, it did open my mind. It did create an alternative uh, view. It did challenge views of the human person. It did challenge to walk in the shoes of the other. As Peter has said earlier in his concluding remarks, it challenges you to look at the person you may not like, the person who might be different to you, the person you might have been raised or taught by society to perhaps despise and to see in that person the face of Christ. So as a teenager, ladies and gentlemen, that was the key formative influence. And I always ask myself the question, if it wasn't there, 
what would I have done? What would I have become? I had a parish priest for the first 15 years of my life who had been trained in Rome from 1928 to 1935. He studied in Rome. No other organization in the world that I know would take someone who spoke seven languages, was trained in Rome, ordained by a future Pope, Cardinal Pacelli, who witnessed firsthand the rise of Mussolini and would put him into a rural Irish parish 10 miles from the border. <laughs> but this little altar boy was delighted. The first foreign words, apart from the Irish language, but the first foreign words, the first words in Italian, I learned from that priest. And I witnessed that priest, day in, day out, leading a community, leading a people, not playing to the gallery. When different political parties would come around election time, those that advocated violence or the taking of life were banned from church grounds. They were not allowed in. There might have been many people that would have liked them to come in. Before those elections, the sermons that would be preached would be about the importance of life from the point of conception to the point of natural death. Nobody had the right to take life, even as an act of revenge. And ladies and gentlemen, this wasn't in an academic environment. This was sometimes where police or army Land Rovers would be preventing people from going to church, making people get out of vehicles and walk. And this priest was unflinching. He preached to his flock. He told them what was right. He did not tell them simply what they might have wanted to hear. And Eva used a very important word and that is prophetic, and I'll come to that later. So ladies and gentlemen, witness growing up in a context where faith and religion and politics and identity had become very conflated, where it couldn't be disaggregated, where one had to test what was the ultimate call on your life. Was it politics? Was it Irish nationalism, or was it your Catholic faith, which stood for something which was universal, which was open to all, that wasn't tribal, that challenged? I, at one stage, pursued a vocation to the priesthood, and um, I did three and a half years, three years in a seminary in Belfast, where those of us who were from Northern Ireland were sent back uh, from Maynooth, and we did our studies right through uh, Belfast, and it was really designed to ensure that you were trained pastorally for a very different world that you would be going into and serving as a priest. I was then sent to Dublin to continue my theology studies, but I couldn't figure out that question as to what was the motivation in my life. Was it a political identity, or was it the call of faith? Now, I probably was a little bit bold because along the way with my seminary studies, I was a member and an activist of the Social Democratic and Labour Party. <laughs> and I thought I'd got away with it until the bishop spotted me on the television after one of the elections. <laughs> and I remember what he said. He said, we have, an, we have enough difficulty in this society with clergy being involved in politics, so you make a choice. And um, I actually did leave the political party. But I couldn't... I couldn't answer for myself in the purity of motive what had the fundamental call on my life. And I went to Dublin to study, and I went to Dublin thinking that the, the solution for the Irish issue was the unification of the island. That's what I wanted. And I thought that was the solution that would end discrimination and end marginalization. But why would my alienation be answered by exporting that to somebody else? And that's where faith gets in, and that's where faith challenges you. So I left seminary, 
I went and studied. I went abroad for the first time to study. I went to Leuven. I saw a Catholic university. And things started to happen that I never thought would ever happen. I started to see that peace took off and the negotiations. And I suppose this is something that, again, faith leaves you with, and I think we're at risk sometimes of losing in our complacency. And that is the redemptive nature at the heart of the Christian message. Some of the pioneers of peace in the end, and I can now say this because the man has passed away, but Martin McGuinness had a very senior figure, was a very senior figure in the Republican movement. I'm sure that along the way, there were many things that he did that he later regretted. At a certain stage, a lot of people would have written him off. But at the end, when it mattered and when it counted, he did actually create peace. And I could point to people on the loyalist or Protestant side that did the same. So that's something that I'm left with for the rest of my life, is never to prematurely write someone off, irrespective of what they have done. Because the power of Christ and the power of the Christian message to penetrate even the toughest of hearts and the toughest of minds is always possible. Before I move to the very final bit, there's one thing if I were to ask or to answer you honestly. When you ask, how has the church shaped who you have become? Without it, I couldn't have walked the path that I've walked. Priests in the parish, priests in school, nuns in school, lay teachers. It was a protected place for me and for those of my era when outside the school it was dangerous. Later in life, and it's an image that I always think of, from inside the school where students who sat beside me ended up serving time, their path took a different way. Others lost their lives. From that school window, I could see the border towers being built and erected. We knew the back roads to avoid them to get the other side of the border. They didn't work. But within 10 years, that Catholic school had brought me from that experience to sitting in Downing Street, listening to a discussion about the peace process and demilitarization. I never thought that was ever possible. When you walk in the footsteps of the other, your mind is opened, your complacency falls away, you come across good people, you come across people that you never thought you'd ever have a conversation with, you come across people and you see their desire for good and for healing. And peace takes people of goodwill and faith on all sides. So what does this mean for my hope for the future of the church? It's this, and I'll summarize, summarize it in seven very, very brief points. I hope for the future of the church that it transforms lives. I hope it is always prophetic to people and the world. I hope it is reflective and prayerful and that its wisdom is grounded on the history of the church and beyond, and not simply the whims of the day. For if it were simply the whims of the day, or seduced by the loudest voice of the time, then my path could have gone a very different route. I hope it is a source of bold and courageous witness that stands with those in need, and the reason I ask those Irish sisters to stand is that I'm very aware that there are many things wrong with the model of Irish Catholicism. But there is one thing right with it. It always stood with the oppressed. Always. 
I hope it is for each of us a source of renewal and liberation, and in turn for the world that is a creative minority, it transforms society. Finally, I hope it never ceases to offer hope, mercy, and redemption in a time in the world when society is very keen on one strike and you're out. Please, 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 the church must never give up on those who fall into sin because the world seems to have given up on that. But this is one entity that must be confident about the redemptive message of Christ irrespective of what anyone has done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vice-Chancellor. What extraordinary diversity that we've just heard in those three accounts. Perhaps you've been sitting for long enough. Would you like to stand up for a couple of minutes and have a shake and you can dance if you like and wiggle. We could sing. ladies and gentlemen. We're going to move now into a, a time um, where you are able to question our, um, the members of our panel. I'm just checking on the time. What we would like you to do is to please hold your questions to, um, to be brief. Uh, this is not encouraged to be a time of long commentaries. Uh, we've heard three extraordinary stories of people of faith, of people of hope, um, from a great diversity of background and from a, um, a great diversity of experiences of church. Eva's had the experience of violence and oppression and Francis has had the experience of, of the same but in such a different place in the world. And the experience of the Quinlan family also was part of violence and oppression um, within that struggling um, colonial period. But um, the products of the formation of um, these people have, have come from those really diverse ki kinds of backgrounds and we deeply appreciate the honesty and the care with which they've told their story. Because uh, it's not an easy thing to do. To, to tell your story like that um, and particularly for Eva, our heart goes out to her in her particular circumstances, um, a woman she deeply admired in her mother and where that um, has formed her, um, that's certainly something that makes me amazed that she's with us and able to speak of her story with um, such great fortitude. So we have Anthony with a roving mic who will give that to you. Now the mic uh, actually is for the live feed for what we're doing this evening. So I'm going to need you to speak up and if um, I can hear the question, I can relay it to the community. So do we have a question? You can direct it to either of our panel or you can ask for it um, to be directed to all of them. So have we got a question here. Just, you know, would you just wait, please, Veronica, until you get the microphone, and a, a brief question, please. Um, seeing as we have a, um, a guest from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and uh, a descendant mm. from the, well, Russia, not in the EU, but we're supposed to be becoming friendlier with uh, a European and church nation. Um, Your question? Has the Holy See established 
plenary councils in any other country uh, apart from Australia? At this point, I can answer that, actually, as a member of the Plenary Council. Uh, the current one here in Australia is the only one currently in progress. Um, but we are well aware that there are many places in the world, including Rome, that are watching how, the, how we do this and how it will come about. Yeah. And another question? Do we have... Well, perhaps um, one thing that I'd really like to do, yes, question over here, but give um, a very, uh, a, an opportunity to Eva to show us some of her show and tell. <laughs> Would you like to do that, Eva? She's got a gorgeous statue there that uh, was a prize, a statue of the Sacred Heart of Jesus that was a prize for her for her religious education, um, plus other gorgeous things. And, and uh, she says they're, they're sacred, they're holy. Your question? So, um, perhaps directed to um, Professor Campbell, um, I, I don't know how many people here are currently paying Catholic school fees, but, but I certainly am. Um, and you've spoken about how important being at a Catholic school was for you in Catholic education. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only parent who is looking with some concern at what seems to be happening in Victoria, where they're cutting... Um, uh, conditions for Catholic schools, so Catholic schools are no longer allowed to have the same say in the people that they employ. And uh, generally, I think I can say I feel the, the noose tightening on um, our freedoms uh, to do things like educate our own children in, in our own schools. Um, I was wondering if you have any um, anything hopeful that you could say about that, I suppose, whether there's uh, uh, things that we could, sh could do or should do or would be done or, or how, that, how you feel that will play out in the future. Thank, uh, thank you for the question. Sorry, I didn't get your first name. Jenny. Jenny, Jenny thank you for the question. Um, Jenny, forgive me if I answer it this way. Um, I'm more familiar, to, I'm still reading myself into Australia after 18 months. Um, so, but let me answer it this way because the same debate comes up in the context of Northern Ireland and the context of Britain, um, where there's a challenge to state support for Catholic education. And to me, I think the church has to reframe the argument. So it can no longer be be argued and defended on the basis of confession alone. For me, it goes to the heart of the open, liberal, plural democracies that we have and the right to be different. And that's where, in that space, Catholic education enriches our liberal democratic order. That's its contribution. That's why it gets public funding. That's why it contributes a whole series of outcomes for within the church, it's about the transmission of faith. It's about formation in that Newmanesque model, not just about the transmission of knowledge, but about the entire formation of creating good citizens and people of faith. But I think when it comes to public subsidy, I think the argument has to be fought and won very clearly on what nature of the liberal democratic order Australia wishes to follow. Totalitarian states cannot stand plurality. Open, liberal, democratic orders have many tributaries flowing in. And in my experience, um, you know, of a, of a particular order where the, it took a long time in my society for the church to get equal funding for its schools. But if I were looking to see what helped most to solve the conflict, it was actually the contribution of Catholic education. It wasn't hard security measures. So that for me is always something, regardless of what society we're in, it speaks fundamentally to the contribution that the church can make in healthcare and education and social services, and that enriches our democracy. Thank you, Francis. Any other questions? Another question? Surely. Yes, Monsignor Michael. Uh, 
code. You know, it's, it, it yes, it is, but that's for the. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I see. So All yes, right. If you turn around and give your question, speak what loudly. Turn around. Speak to the people. Let's talk. <laughs> Ask the question. <laughs> well, my question really is directed to Eva. Um, you, you touched on your Ukrainian um, Catholic background, and of course the Latin Rite Catholic background of the... I think most Catholics are very ignorant of what they refer to the two lungs of the church, don't they? You know, the Eastern um, and, the, and the... And when you say to them that if you're Ukrainian Catholic that you were baptised the Ukrainian church, were you? And therefore you received your confirmation and First Communion as a baby. And then, and then it's, it, it's been a problem still. The, the Ukrainian bishop used to have to write to us and say, don't insist that the children come to the local parish school because they're going to the Ukrainian church or something like that. And I remember at the Second Vatican Council, uh, I think Cardinal Slippy, have you heard of him? <laughs> he was very famous. He refused to speak Latin, which was the language of the council, but he'd finished his speech in French, Dixie, I've spoken, but that was because it was a symbol of that. And, and, and at, the second, at the first section of the Vatican Council, the patriarchs, the Eastern patriarchs, were put below the cardinals, but after that they were put up uh, beyond the cardinals and some have become cardinals. So I'm just saying I think the Plenary Council, hopefully, will talk a little bit about this, educating the wider Catholic Church in Australia, because we have so many eparchs and so many eparchies and so forth, and it's wonderful, really. It's a diversity of the Church of Australia. I, look, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. So uh, you're absolutely right. The church, uh, Ukrainian church in Australia struggled in the 50s and 60s to uh, communicate with the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I always remember I was doing... I was baptised and confirmed. A priest came from Melbourne... So I was baptised about four months after I was born because he hadn't had to wait for that. And then when I went to um, school, I did my first Holy Communion at the Catholic, the Catholic school at La Mania, and then for training for confirmation, and I can't recall how it came up, but I was all trained, all trained, we were all going, and then somewhere it came, it came out that I had already been confirmed. So it was a really interesting because the, 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 the sisters, the school couldn't figure it out mm -hmm. and I didn't know what was going on. So I've, 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 I've never been... Conf we did not do that ceremony again and um, the sacrament again. Um, and then later I got married in the Ukrainian Catholic Church. So I, once a, a, a canonist lawyer from Canada came over and we were talking and he said he pronounced that I was actually Ukrainian Catholic and not, a, and not Roman Catholic. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> So yeah. anyway, um, and I'm aware of Cardinal Schlippe and, um, and, 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 mm. and the, the struggle of the church to be recognised. Mm. Okay. We've got an, another question. Yeah. I, just on a personal comment, I, my brother-in-law, um, his um, grandfather was actually a priest in the Ukrainian Catholic Church and was killed by Stalin. Um, so I... I <laughs> felt strongly that link of the oppression and the violence that has been suffered by so many people. Yes. Hi. Um, my name's Jonathan Wolfrey. Speak up. Um, my question... Well, first of all, thank you to each and every one of the speakers for sharing your story. Um, it was, was very uh, profound to hear those different stories and those different journeys and I always learn a lot from that. My question is for Peter Quinlan. Uh, Peter, you have a very important role to play for Western Australia on behalf of the government um, to uphold the laws of Western Australia. Uh, pardon me. Uh, how do you balance out? Some of those aren't always consistent with, with the Catholic view of the world. So, so how do you perform your role uh, diligently to what you've been empowered to do by the state of Western Australia and keep your faith in it and make those decisions as to to how you adjudicate from the law and and balance your faith within that. Well, I, I suppose I'd return to what Francis said about living in a liberal, pluralist democracy. Um, I was a lawyer for nearly 30 years before I was a judge. 
Um, and, and, you, and, and the question you ask is a question that is often asked of Catholic or Christian lawyers. It, it was a question that was continually asked of the most recent appointment to the Supreme Court, who happens to be an Orthodox rabbi as well. Uh, and just in that respect, he kept, he was asked on a number of occasions with interviews, well, how are you going to reconcile um, your Orthodox Judaism with being a judge? Uh, to which my response was, oh, it's fine to have the Orthodox Judaism as long as we don't start letting bloody Catholics in, we'll be, <laughs> we'll be fine. And, and really, the, the answer is that we exist and we work in the world, we, uh, we, um, we have to serve um, our particular professions as they exist um, in, in our society, um, you, would, you would find that there is remarkably little occasion upon which a lawyer or a judge in a country such as Australia would find that the application of their task and their job requires them to do something that would be contrary to their religious beliefs. Hmm. Um, it has never happened in the course of um, my legal practice. That's not to say that when you're doing certain work, um, you do not feel that the outcomes are uh, not what you would necessarily want if you were the master of the universe and you could make up every result. But in a sense, that should be the same with anybody who has a principled life and has to engage in a job which, which requires um, the administration of objective rules. I'm sure that there are lots of bishops who have to apply the canon law of the church in relation to all sorts of things where um, if they had a free hand, they might do otherwise. But they apply the law because that's the particular task that they have to do. And, I, and, and, and as I say, I, I think um, uh, it, it, it in, in some sense... Um, and, I, and I'm sure that your question isn't suggesting this, but there, there still remains in some sense an, uh, a suspicion that somehow people who profess a religious faith are unable to participate in a secular pluralist society. And... Thank you. And... Um, and that, and, that susp and that suspicion is something that our participation in civil society um, is, is important to dispel. Um, it comes from an assumption that, um, that there is this blank slate human being who, can, who brings no life experience to a particular job, and it's, it's simply not true. Thank you. Well, we've come to a point now where we um, are going to move to the next stage of our evening, but um, we've heard about being prophetic, about being called, about um, from the world of education, from the world of business and from the world of law. So it's certainly uh, been very, very encouraging and very wondrous in the diversity. So I'll now ask Oren to um, conclude the proceedings. We're going to have some opportunity for um, conversation after the event um, closes. So I think what we might do is it will, um, we'll close the event for the evening. Um, refreshments are going to be offered uh, upstairs, I think, Anthony, you said, Anthony somewhere. Um, we'll follow Anthony, I think is probably the best bet. Um, we were aware that we had eminent speakers um, this evening, but I, I really don't think we'd expected 
uh, the depth of reflection and the eloquence that, um, with which they delivered it. So um, if we could just thank the, the speakers. <laughs> Monsignor, could you come up so we could present some gifts? Uh, We're giving them a bottle of wine, and there's wine upstairs too, I believe. It's the history of St. Mary's Cathedral. <laughs> but there, there's also wine somewhere. Upstairs now. Thank you.